Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamiko Brown-Nagan, the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard, and I am delighted to welcome you to day two of Radical Commitments, The Life and Legacy of Angela Davis. I want to extend a special welcome to the 40 students from Cambridge Ringe and Latin School. Yeah. Wonderful. And I want to welcome back our Summer of Hope students. A couple of weeks ago, with this conference on the horizon, I was reminded of the song, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. It was one of the anthems of the Civil Rights Movement, and its first verse contains the words, they say that freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, we've struggled so long. We must be free, we must be free. Now, Angela Davis has invoked this song in her writings, as have I and other scholars of civil and human rights movements. The song reflects an important truth. Freedom is not given. It must be actively sought. Freedom always has been and still is a dynamic struggle, whether here in the United States or around the world. But the song doesn't just remind us of that active struggle, it also begs the question why? Why is freedom denied to so many? To quote Angela Davis herself, there's simultaneously resignation and promise in that line. There is critique and inspiration. We must be free, we must be free. But are we really free? The point I want to make in quoting this song and Davis's interpretation of it is that the history of freedom struggles is very much a living history. Quests for justice continue. Freedom struggles are happening in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces, and yes, in our system of crime and punishment. Now, biography offers one avenue to explore the long and ongoing history of freedom struggles. Earlier this month, at a Radcliffe panel discussion titled Writing Black Lives, I spoke with Amani Perry and Robert Reed Farr about their work as biographers of literary greats Lorraine Hansberry and James Baldwin, while drawing on my own biographical work on Constance Baker Motley, the civil rights lawyer and judge. Records of the lives and works of figures like these and of the networks of artists, thinkers, and activists in which they were situated provide an opportunity to learn about the struggles that these great figures led and the ways they sought to create a truly democratic world. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that the biography the living legacy of Angela Davis, another great leader and intellectual, promises a similar opportunity to listen and to learn. Through her life and her life's work, we learn about the Black Liberation Movement, the Women's Liberation Movement, and the Prison Abolition Movement, among others. We learn about organizing, about political empowerment and social change, and we learn about the work that remains to be done. Our program today is structured to provide interdisciplinary perspectives on three core themes of Davis's life, revolution, feminisms, and abolition. It promises to be an illuminating and a productive set of discussions. Now in a moment, I'll turn things over to my colleague, Jane Kaminsky, but first I want to thank the many people who made this conference possible. Along with Jane, those people include Marilyn Dunn and Ken V. Phillips of the Schlesinger Library. I'm also grateful to Becky Wasserman, Jessica Vicklin, and their teams, and staff across the Institute. Thank you. Thanks as well to all of our speakers, to members of the planning committee, and to Elizabeth Henton, who served as chair of that committee. 
And of course, I extend my gratitude to Hutchins Center for the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research and its esteemed director, Henry Louis Gates Jr., for partnering with us to bring the Angela Davis papers to the Radcliffe Institute. <laughs> Finally, allow me to thank Angela Davis for taking the time to attend this remarkable conference and for and for entrusting her archives to the Institute. Thank you. Now, I'm pleased to turn things over to Jane Kaminsky. Jane is the Forsheimer Foundation Director of the Sessinger Library on the History of Women in America here at Radcliffe, as well as the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in warmly welcoming Jane to the stage. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to join Tamiko in welcoming you back to this second day of radical commitments. As Tamiko noted, Radcliffe's acquisitions of the papers of Angela Yvonne Davis, a collaboration between Schlesinger Library and the Hutchins Center, is the occasion of this conference, and I'm going to talk about the archive. Those papers landed here by moving truck in January of 2018 a moment that marked, in a way, the end of one story and the beginning of another. The first story begins, of course, with Davis not only living, but keeping the records of her remarkable life. That was, in itself, a bold choice, a choice for the future. I don't know if anybody else read in the New York Times last week the conversation between the novelists Anne Patchett and Elizabeth Strout. Uh, which contains the following exchange, which I'll quote briefly. Patch it. I permanently delete them. I have no papers. <laughs> Turns to Strout, do you have papers? Strout, I do have papers, and I rip them up as soon as I'm done with them. <laughs> Patch it. Well, that's the definition of not having papers. Laughs. It's not like they're going to the archives in Texas. Strout, oh my god, no, no, no. I rip them in four squares and then I put them in the wastebasket. It's lovely, I enjoy it. I'm not going to leave a drop. Not a clean sheet, just my work. Patch it, I'm gonna die next to the fireplace, chucking. <laughs> this is to emphasize that loss, whether by fire or shredding, or just the war of attrition that is life, is the common condition of the records of humanity. Angela Davis safeguarded her work against loss and then decided to turn her archive over for perpetual preservation and public study so that generations of future activists, thinkers, students, and storytellers could learn from what she lived and did and could ask hard questions about it. Even if you're a scholar who regularly uses special collections libraries like the Schlesinger, you probably don't know the work involved in accessioning a large multimedia high priority collection like the papers of Angela Davis. I'll tell you the merest skeleton of the story of how these materials got from Davis's storage unit home and office in California to our vaults uh, underneath the library next door, ready for delivery to researchers starting this very Friday, November 1st. First, three library staff members, curator Dr. Kenvi Phillips, and archivist Amber Moore and Jahan Sinclair spent several days on site with Angela and Gina getting the materials ready to move. Then Jahan and Amber, together with lead archivist Jenny Gottwalls, spent every working day for the next 20 months organizing, conserving, describing, and readying those papers turning a rough inventory of the contents of the 156 cartons loaded into a moving truck in the Bay Area into a meticulous finding aid describing to researchers a collection spanning 129.25 linear feet, 
195 and a half file boxes, five folio boxes, 14 folio plus boxes, eight oversized boxes, three supersized boxes, three supersized folders, 120 photograph folders, 131 sound cassettes, 16 sound tape reels, 65 video cassettes, 17 sound discs, 38 video discs, two film reels in four, uh, 16 millimeter, 7.92 megabytes of born digital materials, and on and on. Angela, I don't know if you knew you had all that. <laughs> It's arranged in 12 series from biographical and personal through audiovisual. Jahan, Amber, Kenvi, and Jenny, may I ask you to stand up and take recognition for this work? So our gathering today delves deeply into Davis's life's work. We are so very fortunate that her life's work, including the preservation and transmission of these materials, coupled with the archival labors of Kenvi, Amber, Jahan, and Jenny, will allow other gatherings in far off years to make connections we have not yet thought of and to ask questions we have not yet dreamt of, uh, not yet dreamt of even by the amazing panels gathered with us today. And with that, I'll turn the podium over to my colleague and co-conspirator, Elizabeth Hinton, professor of history and of African and African-American studies here at Harvard, who will frame the program for you. Thank you all. Thank you for that introduction, Jane. I'd like to echo Jane and Tamiko in welcoming everyone to the conference, those of you in the room and those of you live streaming from around the world. The seeds of this conference, as Jane indicated, were born about three years ago, shortly before the publication of my first book on the history of mass criminalization. Jane had recently arrived at Harvard to direct the Schlesinger, and I was just two years into my position then on the tenure track. Jane told me she was committed to expanding the Schlesinger's collections and beginning new kinds of discussions at this institution, and she asked if I would be interested in working with her to plan a conference at the Schlesinger on mass incarceration, gender, and the family. We spent the rest of the afternoon brainstorming what such a conference would look like, and little did I know then, the library was already in talks with Angela Davis about acquiring her papers. My initial discussion with Jane blossomed into what we have convened today, a conference celebrating the Schlesinger Library's acquisition of the papers of Angela Y. Davis, and a day and a half of discussions that take Angela Davis's life and legacy as a starting point to imagine new directions in scholarship, in activism, and in social transformation. Thank you, Jane, for trusting me with this project before many others would have, and for all the work you were doing in your role as director of the Schlesinger. It has been a pleasure working with you on this endeavor. On that note, I'd also like to thank the Schlesinger Library for its ongoing commitment to diversifying and broadening the scope of its collections to include often marginalized and certainly underappreciated women. The acquisition of the Angela Y. Davis papers marks an important step towards this end. And let me pause here to also thank my dear colleague, Henry Louis Gates Jr., for helping to make this acquisition possible. It simply could not happen without you. And I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank you, Skip. You have opened up new spaces in the, within the academy and in public discourse where the questions at the center of this conference could be considered. I value your fortitude and the incredible communities you have built both here at Harvard and beyond. And thanks also to Abby Wolf if she's here for all the work she does behind the scenes. In addition to Jane and the Schlesinger and Skip in the Hutchins Center, the acquisition of the papers of Angela Y. Davis, the Freed by the People exhibit, and the Radical Commitments Conference have involved many more hands. They are the product of dinners and brainstorming sessions across the university and in my office hours and, and among colleagues all over the country that ultimately co coalesced into what we will now share. For one, African and African American Studies PhD candidates Abigail Neighbor and Jackie Wang received special fellowships from Radcliffe and Harvard Libraries to review the papers of Angela Y. Davis during the summer of 2018. Jackie is my graduate advisee, author of the celebrated 2018 book Carceral Capitalism, a current Radcliffe Fellow, and a renowned poet, and on her way to the new school next year. Jackie, if you're here, will you raise your hand? Let's give her a round of applause. She's a rising star in the field and graciously stayed with this project as a member of the exhibit committee. Jackie, thank you for all your work and insight. 
The foremost ideas for the structure of the conference and the composition of our panels came out of a year of planning and discussions among members of our conference committee. No single group is more directly responsible for the shape of this event, and none of us would be here without their time and dedication. As chair of that committee, I would like to recognize members for their efforts now. When I call your name, please stand if you are present, and I apologize in advance, we have fancy, these are fancy people with fancy titles, so I'll do my best. Dylan, professor of American history and professor of African and African American studies and of studies of women, gender, and sexuality, Robin Bernstein, executive director of the Schlesinger, Marilyn Dunn. Victor S. Thomas, professor of history and of African and African American studies and history department chair, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Schlesinger curator for race and ethnicity, Ken B. Phillips. Caldwell Kitcomb, Professor of African and African American Studies and Philosophy and Chair of the Department of African and African American Studies, Tommy Shelby. Henry J. Friendly, Professor of Law, Carol Steiker. Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies and of Social Studies, Brandon Terry. And Executive Director of Academic Ventures at Radcliffe, Rebecca Wasserman. Please stand so we may recognize you if you're here. And although she didn't formally serve on the committee, we are grateful to Jessica Vick Vicklin, Director of Events at Radcliffe, for literally buttressing us all. And Jessica, I'd imagine you're already somewhere standing, if you're even in this room, but give a wave if you're here. She's off doing something important. Thank you. You'll be hearing from many of our committee members at different points throughout the day, and I would just like to say how much I've appreciated your ideas, your line edits, your service, and your lasting commitment to our vision. Thank you. It's incredibly exciting to finally be here after years of anticipation to behold all of you in this space. And I apologize on behalf of the conference committee and Radcliffe to all those who were unable to register who might be watching us or in the overflow room. This conference sold out uh, within 10 minutes faster than a Beyonce concert. And uh, <laughs> we simply did not have the space or resources to accommodate all interested parties. So I'm just as excited to all of those who are watching in the overflow room and on live stream and for those whose circumstances prevent us from being here today who might one day read transcripts of the conference in prison or another place or time. Of course, when the papers of Angela Y. Davis open on November 1st, the issues that we will consider today will take on an everlasting significance. The scope of the conference was born in many respects out of that tremendous archival collection. I had the great honor of being one of the first researchers to examine the papers and the boxes that Jane discussed as I plan freed by the people. And indeed, the collection was so stimulating for me and so rich. I left a good, a virtually no box unturned. Without question, the papers of Angela Y. Davis is a national treasure. Working with the collection, the unique and rare material it contains, the correspondence, the photographs, the unpublished speeches, the records, the audio and the video, has profoundly influenced my own research moving forward, and I can't wait to see the work that comes out of the archive for generations to come. The conference committee had a daunting task. As a figure, Angela Davis, one of the most prominent philosophers, political prisoners, feminists, and freedom fighters in the history of the United States and the world, as well as her papers, demand years, decades of study and consideration, panel discussions, performances, and roundtables. And somehow we settled on these three themes to ground our discussions that map along the chronological turns of Angela Davis's life and force us to confront the contours of the most important social movements of the 20th century. So let me give you a sense of what we're in today broadly. Yesterday, of course, we witnessed an earth-shattering performance by lead musical director Terry Lynn Carrington and an unforgettable conversation with some of the women closest to Angela personally, politically, and professionally. This morning, we will have discussions on the question of revolution and feminism, take a lunch break, and pick up again this afternoon with an important discussion of abolition. The conference will end with a keynote conversation between Angela Davis and Nefertiti XM Tajar, introduced by the women of the Pathways Collective, a study group of which I am a member that meets inside a women's prison. There will be opportunities for those in the room to engage with our panelists. For the first three sessions, we ask if you would like to ask a question that you line up behind the microphone in the central aisle. We, of course, welcome all questions, but please ask a genuine question rather than only offering a comment, and try not to repeat a question that has already been posed. We are, of course, under severe time restraints. We ask that we foster a community of respect for one another in the audience and for our presenters. For the keynote conversation, there will not be an opportunity for dialogue with the audience. Instead, we have solicited questions from students, and the idea is to foster a meaningful intergenerational conversation. 
In addition to our panelists representing a range of generations, in our audience we have centurions like Dorothy Burnham, who we honored last night, an activist who challenged Jim Crow in Angela Davis's hometown of Birmingham in the 1940s, and has significantly advanced the struggle for social and economic equality ever since. And as Dean Brown Nagan mentioned, we also have local high school students and Summer of Hope participants, youth who spent a week at Radcliffe over the summer in partnership with the Boston Public Schools and the Juvenile Alternative Resolution Program of the, of the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Let me return to an earlier point here. Angela Davis is the prism through which we are considering questions of revolution and feminisms and abolition, but the conference has always been about something much larger. We hope and we expect our discussions will be more than just about presenting and attending a conference. We have convened these discussions in order to collectively think about the way to transform malignant conditions in our own historical moment, and this should extend far beyond the Knopfel Center and the Schlesinger Library. Now, committing to radical change and honoring the life and legacy of Angela Davis means different things to different people. For scholars, we hope that after today, your work is reinvigorated and reimagined in light of new understandings of the influence and significance of Angela Davis's political philosophy, her own philosophical corpus, but also the thinkers and work that shaped her ideas and the ideas that she has shaped in turn. For activists, revolutionaries, and abolitionists, we hope these discussions will embolden your struggle and empower your actions, advancing freedom for us all in the process. For young people in the audience and students, we hope you leave us inspired by the historic efforts to bring forth racial and economic justice, gender equality, and the liberation of oppressed people around the world. And finally, this conference has special meaning and significance for Harvard. I have now been here six years, and never before have questions of revolution, of abolishing the prison system, and of liberation been considered so prominently. In this sense, Harvard is today modeling the best of what a university can be, probing discussions on difficult issues and representing contested viewpoints. If you are not uncomfortable at some point today, then we're not doing our job. This university will not be, cannot be the same after these proceedings. And as home to the papers of Angela Y. Davis, it will forever be changed. I encourage all of us to ask some serious questions today and in the days and years that follow about the mission and purpose of this institution and the communities on this campus. We can't be in this space confronting Angela Davis's life's work and its implications without recognizing the struggles against racism and oppress oppression that are very much alive on this campus. When just last Thursday, an anonymous Harvard affiliate called the Harvard University Police Department on a group of Harvard College students, most of whom were students of color, when they were preparing a poetry installation in the yard as part of a pre-approved activity for the Romance Languages and Literatures course performing Latinidad, and instead of calmly greeting the students or asking to speak to their professor, the officer photographed the students' IDs and demanded proof of their right to be there. This was not the first time such an intimidating encounter happened in that class or on this campus, and unless we fail to change, it will not be the last. And we can't be in this space without recognizing that just last night during our musical performance, the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign met with Harvard's corporation on shareholder responsibility on the heels of the release of its Harvard to Prison Pipeline report. For more than a year, the Prison Divestment Campaign has brought to the forefront questions about the ways in which this institution is entangled in the atrocity of mass incarceration and has engaged the entire campus in thinking about the kinds of investments Harvard's can and should make to advance social justice and equality, including expanding educational opportunities for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, which is something that I have been pushing since I arrived. In this moment in the history of the United States, it's particularly fitting that our gathering is happening at Radcliffe, where Dean Tomiko Brown-Nagan, the first black woman to serve in such a role in the history of this institution, is leading the way in redefining the purpose and responsibility of higher education in general and Harvard in particular. Dean Brown-Nagan has expanded the role of Radcliffe at Har Harvard and in the greater Boston community by partnering with local organizations to offer programs such as a Summer of Hope and in dedicating resources that will foster educational opportunities and, and social transformation. Dean Brown-Nagan's work in this respect has ensured that the discussions that take place today will continue to live on beyond the gates of Harvard. Thank you, Tomiko, for your vision and for your support. And just to close, 
The exhibit, Angela Davis, Freed by the People, is meant to bring some of the questions at the center of radical commitments outside of the Harvard community to engage in a different kind of dialogue. In our resource room, we invite you to join conversations with incarcerated women in the Pathways Collective and, and area students. And big thanks again, once again, to Meg Ratzel and Kenvi Phillips and our amazing exhibit committee for all of their work in planning and structuring the exhibit. Visit the gallery at the newly reno renovated Schlesinger if you, had not, if you have not yet done so. And if, you, if you've had the chance to see it, I encourage you to return because I imagine that after our conversations today, you'll come away with um, a new take on many of the objects we've included. And you have until March. If there's nothing else that I've learned from the time I've spent in the Angela Y. Davis papers and from the activism and work produced by our distinguished participants at this conference, it's that a new society is always possible. In fact, it is our foremost responsibility to build a different kind of world for our children and our children's children. Together, using the life and legacy of Angela Davis as a guide, we can imagine a different kind of future, one that is never far from our grasp. And on that note, it's revolution time. <laughs> I'd like to invite to the stage our first panel, moderated by my brilliant friend and colleague, Brandon Terry, Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies and of Social Studies here at Harvard. Panelists and Brandon, please take your seats. Now, I don't want y'all to think all we do here at Harvard is thank each other all the time, but <laughs> I do want you to give another round of applause for Elizabeth Hinton. It's just really... <laughs> to be able to pull something off like this as a junior scholar um, is just remarkable, and uh, it's, it's a real honor to have her as now my senior colleague. Uh, she just received tenure, for those of you who don't know. Yeah. Now, in putting this conference together and in trying to name its organizing themes, we thought it crucial to begin with revolution. We did so not simply, although this is part of it, not simply because far too many celebrations of the heroes of black liberation like Professor Angela Davis evade the radical challenge of the revolutionary ideal in politics but also because revolution is, in many respects, the idea, the preoccupation, and the practice through which Professor Angela Davis became one of the most significant political philosophers and activists of our age. As Professor Gates remarked last night, one profoundly important feature of this archive is that we will get a more comprehensive understanding for all time of the intellectual and political development of this towering, Afro-American political philosopher, one who has helped so many of us reimagine what is possible in the realm of political economy, punishment, politics, and plain human relation. In her graduate research, Professor Davis explored the philosopher Immanuel Kant's ambivalent mix of trepidation and enthusiasm toward the French Revolution. And alongside the leading figures of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, Herbert Marcuse, Theodore Adorno, and even the young Jürgen Habermas, she pursued an answer to the great question of 20th century Marxism. Why had the European working classes embraced fascism and reaction rather than the revolution prophesied by Marx? And to pose that question was to ask, implicitly or explicitly, which groups or forces might we look to in the present for emancipatory possibilities? Unfortunately, the history of my discipline, political theory and philosophy, is still so partitioned by race that it has largely failed to appreciate Professor Davis as arguably the most incisive contributor to these debates, given her analyses of the significance of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and imperialism in destroying the solidarities and insights necessary for radical struggle. Mm -hmm. When Professor Davis returned to the United States, it was in great part to participate in revolution, 
both as a member of the Che Lumumba Club of the Communist Party and as an independent thinker in productive tension with other revolutionary efforts like the Black Panther Party. Even her decision to go to prison rather than flee the country was in part on her account about the desire to remain engaged in an American praxis of revolution. Like the greatest political prisoners of the modern age, she and her supporters seized upon the fairer and hysteria of her trial to give broader exposure to arguments concerning the revolutionary possibilities of late 20th century movements for communism, black liberation, feminism, and anti-imperialism all around the globe. Even amidst the repression of black radicalism and the surge of conservative reaction that we still have not shaken, Professor Davis has held fast and advocated for something akin to what Martin Luther King has called a revolution in values. She's forced us to rethink the place of prisons and punishment in our society. But why hear it from me when we can hear it from Professor Davis herself? In one of her speeches for the Soledad brothers, Professor Davis proclaimed that liberation is synonymous with revolution. A revolution is not just armed struggle, it's not just the period in which you can take over. A revolution has a very, very long spectrum. Che made the very important point that the society you're going to build is already reflected in the nature of the struggle that you're carrying out. And one of the most important things in relationship to that is the building of collective spirit, getting away from this individualist orientation towards personal salvation and personal involvement. One of the most important things that has to be done in the carrying out of a revolutionary struggle is to merge those two different levels, to merge the personal with the political where they're no longer separate. Today, I hope to talk about the political and the personal aspects of revolution. What drives people toward revolutionary practice? What are the personal costs and burdens of embarking on such struggle? What sustains those who try, by any means necessary, to build a world they see as more just or more perfect? And perhaps most importantly for our time, what happens in the aftermath of revolution? How do we wrestle with the meaning of revolutionary efforts when it seems as if the hopes and horizons that animated revolutions of the past have been defeated or eclipsed, and the ideals or symbols that once animated the greatest sacrifice are instead lived as the ruins of our present. I couldn't think of a better group to discuss these questions with us than the one we have today. And so I will keep introductions extremely brief. Please refer to the bios in your pro program for all of their illustrious accomplishments but allow me to introduce this amazing panel in the order they will speak. Please welcome Trevor Fowler, an important leader of the anti-apartheid movement and former city manager of Johannesburg and visiting professor at the Witt School of Governance in Johannesburg, South Africa. Let me welcome Robin Spencer, associate professor of history at Lehman College and easily one of the leading historians of black radicalism, and especially the history of black women in radical politics and the Black Panther Party. Robin Kelly, by all accounts, one of the greatest black intellectuals of our time. Yes. <laughs> I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> he has written widely on basically everything that has happened to black people, including black radicalism, music, and U.S. history. And he is the distinguished professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair of U.S. History at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And lastly, let me say it is an absolute honor to welcome Erica Huggins, the phenomenal activist and educator who is not only one of the leading figures of the Black Panther Party, but also one of the most important figures in the history of radical approaches to American education and somebody who needs to be recognized as such. So please give a round of applause to this panel. I will turn it over to Trevor and get out of the way. Good morning. Good morning. 
It's uh, indeed an honor to be here this morning to uh, honor the life and the legacy of a great friend, a mentor, and a person who not only shaped my life, but also shaped the struggle for which I dedicated my life, the struggle for freedom, of deepening democracy, eradication of poverty, the right of all people to release the potential of the human spirit to create a society which is free from inequality, abuse by one human being over another. Now, generally uh, in South Africa, we, we start a, a speech with a slogan. And the slogan is, Amanda! <laughs> which means power. <laughs> Um, speaking as, uh, from the, my perspective as a South African who has lived in North America and uh, in both apartheid and democratic South Africa, I've added to the topic, was the struggle for what we in South Africa call the National Democratic Revolution influenced by the Black Power Movement and the Civil Rights Struggle? Yes. The answer is a definitive yes. Let me digress for a moment and touch on how I was influenced. I went into exile from apartheid South Africa as a teenager. I saw the struggles uh, of the civil rights struggles here, the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King, the rise of the Panther Party, but it also shaped my perspective on being black. In South Africa, I grew up in an environment where the regime, apartheid regime, defined you by your ethnicity and the language you spoke. And we lived in separate communities and were forced to live in separate communities and were kept apart by law. So indeed, when I was uh, first introduced to the concept of, of, uh, of black power, I understood what it meant to unite the people, the oppressed people of South Africa. And it was taken up by Steve Biko about how people who were classified as colored, as Indian, and as African, all had a similar identity based on their oppression of being black. I, let me just say that I, um, I joined the, the African National Congress and armed struggle when I was 19 in Lusaka, Zambia. While there, my first introduction to Angela Davis was in September 1970. The Zambia Times carried a centerfold article on imperialism, U.S. imperialism, and the circumstances leading to the U.S. government's hunt for Angela Davis. The ANC said I should, re should go to Canada and finish a degree in civil engineering, and I left and landed in Chicago on the 13th of October, 1970, which coincidentally was the same date that Angela was arrested. On March the 8th, 1971, a few months later, I spoke at a free Angela Davis public uh, meeting, and the other speaker was Charlene Mitchell. And uh, interestingly, Charlene Mitchell um, his birthday is the same as my mother's birthday. <laughs> and uh, Charlene became my mother in, uh, in the US. <laughs> um, thereafter, I became intim intimately involved in the campaign and over a period of time became friends with Angela as well as her friends and colleagues. In fact, I married Shirley Williams, 
who was the national organizer of the National United Committee to Free Angela Davis, and later became the Southern California sub-editor of the People's World newspaper, the organ of the Southern California district of the CPUSA. Now, talking about the Black Power Movement, it has its roots in civil rights, but in particular, the racist oppression and the right of people to vote. There are parallels in the civil rights and our struggle against apartheid. For example, the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955 also occurred in Johannesburg in January 1957. The, um, what we refer to uh, during the same period as the uh, campaign against unjust laws where people submitted themselves to arrest because they broke unjust laws such as sit sitting on, uh, on a bench that was marked only for, that said Europeans only or whites only. And it is that, that those roots which are similar. And of course the struggle for victories in, in, and gaining in civil rights in the USA gave black people, black South Africans, great pride and achievement of black Americans, but also hope that such gains are possible in South Africa. Bishop uh, Emeritus Desmond Tutu spoke here at Harvard in 2007, and he said, when I was uh, nine or so, I picked up a tattered copy of the Ebony magazine and read about Jackie Robinson, a black man like us, who had broken into the major league baseball. I did not know baseball from ping pong. <laughs> but that was totally irrelevant. What mattered was that a black man had made it against huge odds. The distinguishing factor between the struggle for civil rights and the black power movement and the anti-apartheid struggle is the distinction between the form and the demands of the struggle. The form of the civil rights struggle was a passive resistance campaign against, uh, for rights already contained in the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution. However, the Black Power Movement was about challenging the white establishment. The demands of the Black Power Movement the Black Panther Party, the Chela Mumba Club, Club of the CPUSA, were for change to the system, which was at the root of the racist, apartheid, uh, racist and political repression. Black power, first coined by Stokely Carmichael in 66, to express a position to, for black people to have representation. Also, the demand that the power structure supporting white supremacy be dismantled and replaced with sovereignty for, for black people. The approach rejected the notion that reformist actions such as civil rights could gain, could end inequality and racism. The focus for more rights by black people and the pacifist philosophy by Dr. Martin Luther King was really drawn from the struggles of Mahatma Gandhi to gain independence from India in 1947. It was based on the pacifist philosophy of Satyagraha, which was developed by Gandhi in 1906, when he lived in South Africa from 1903 to, to 1913. The passive resistance campaign in the South achieved some concessions, but a comparison between the power relations between India and the USA were different because the Indian population were in the majority and passive resistance really led to their independence, while in the USA, black people were a minority. The key molding factor was that trade 
by the Euro British colonialists and European colonialists was not only for commodities, but in people, which ended, to, which was about slavery. In India, the trade was really about commodities. And this slave trade ended in the loss of millions of lives. Despite the introduction of uh, anti-segregation laws, racist and physical and verbal abuse continues in various forms today. Most notably, the enrichment of the prison industrial complex, as Professor Davis has potently conceptualized. This legacy of violence is what shapes racism in the US today and violence against both young, both young black women and men. Well, Dr. Martin Luther King's deep-seated belief that passive resistance would lead to a change, the door to the root cause of the structure of white, white supremacy was challenged. When Angela Davis demanded an end to capitalism, the root cause for racism and continued criminal violence, in the eyes of the Reagan establishment, it required a response which resulted in the killings of many young people and her imprisonment for many years. And the massive campaign around the world to free Angela Davis created a moment in US history, a revolutionary moment, where the consequences of which led to the release of Angela Davis, but also the withdrawal of US troops from Vietnam in 1972. This revolutionary nationalism attracted young South African freedom fighters to the struggle for black, of black people in the US. And our struggle for, for liberation was really uh, spurred on by her ultimate release. And the campaign for uh, the release of Nelson Mandela was built on the infrastructure that was uh, for the release of, of Angela Davis. So there's a tie between Angela's release and the release of Nelson Mandela. Um, I will close by really talking about two things. That uh, the key ingredient to revolutionary change is persistence, a commitment to a radical future where human beings are not judged by the color of their skin, nor their gender, nor their sexual orientation, but their concrete action and commitment to an inclusive society. A society where every person's contribution is valued, every person is able to contribute to the development of a society free from poverty, hunger, unemployment, and inequality. And let me say that once in government, I discovered that the struggle, despite it's the blood and the tears and the sweat, is a lot easier than gaining, uh, eliminating poverty against the monopoly capital. Mm -hmm. So in this radical commitment, which my mentor, friend, and comrade in struggle has lived and continues to live, Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. This is the kind of event where the remarks that you prepared so diligently with the big words and the citations kind of goes out the window as you kind of become just overwhelmed by just the power. The exhibit is so moving. I feel like I want everyone to go, just make sure you go over there. And so my remarks kind of reflect some thoughts that I've had um, since arriving. Um, I want to use my time to reflect on the meaning of these archives to the black freedom movement. It has to be said that scholarly analyses of the archival recover of black women's history 
have highlighted the violence, the erasure, the silences, all of the things that have shielded black women's lives um, from really being known. What a gift it is to have the treasure trove of materials contained in the Angela Y. Davis archives available. I have to call out um, Angela Davis's practice of self-preservation, self-determination in, in keeping and gathering her papers as something that is, should be understood as happening on behalf of all of the other women who have had their history torn to shreds, whose histories we've had to piece together from shadows and outlines to salvage them from being erased. Thank you for attending to your archives, even as the world called your name. Thank you for the foresight, for the commitment to self-making and radical world building and letting us see the possibilities. I mean, we, I know we're here at Harvard and all, <laughs> <laughs> but let us be clear that the history of the black radical tradition has been demonized, surveilled, delegitimatized, marginalized. In college classrooms, in the popular imagination, and more direly, it has been kept out of the K to 12 curriculum. <laughs> if new generations have a hard time knowing who Angela Davis is, imagine how few know about people like George Jackson, Charlene Mitchell, and Dorothy Burnham. Angela's archives will point us in beautiful new directions. Her papers will provide oxygen to people, to movement, and ideas that desperately need to be aired. They will provide fuel. Um, dare I say they may bring back the language of revolution, not solely by uh, tracing the history of armed self-defense, communist organizing, and radical black left feminism, but reminding us about the power of love and the imperative of solidarity. We desperately need this knowledge. People power is on display all over the globe as I speak. Resistance is everywhere. Davis's papers remind us of the meta global networks and the power of every single one of the hundreds of thousands of German school children who participated in a Roses for Angela campaign. Revolutions need archives, theory, and roses. In the archives, researchers will find not just the outward facing political work, but the architecture of ideas, the evolution of consciousness, the travels, the relentless repression apparatus, and the vast evidence of the worldwide impact that Angela Davis has had. They will also find the love, the joy, the peaks and valleys of political organizing, the habits of mind, the humor, the musical culture, the networks that, that sustain not just her one life, but that has sustained movement. The placement of these archives are a victory for the movement because it has rooted this history in a new way. And here I should say that it matters in an anti-black world that Angela Davis is a black woman and unapologetically feminist, blues-loving, Afro-wearing, left-leaning black woman. Black women are rarely allowed universality, unboxed breath. But from Palestine to South Africa, to Brazil, to Brooklyn, to Oakland, Angela Davis is heralded because of the political analysis of her many writings and her ongoing organizing and educational work. In Haiti, she has been there. South Africa, supporting the Palestinian struggles as well. That the recognized human rights advocate and undisputed moral compass of these United States is a black woman is phenomenal. Perhaps the best thing about the Davis archives is that they are more than history or a glance at a forgotten past. They represent the present and the future. The exhibit features someone right now considered a political prisoner held on solitary held in solitary confinement, and who was on death row. Someone who is the center of an international campaign for his freedom, 
and I'm referring to Mumia Abu-Jamal. The Davis archives are not a place for nostalgia. They demand action. Vincent Harding, eminent scholar, once said, when you know, you owe. That is the mandate of the Davis archives. I hope that the archives are incorporated into college classrooms and assignments, that some small fraction of it can be digitized and made available online where people all over the world can access it, and that school children, young people, can be brought to the exhibit and their teachers can be trained on how to bring this history into their classrooms. Thank you. Now I have to go after the real Robin, right? <laughs> OK, that was beautiful. God, God. OK, so um, I have a lot to say in a very short time. It says five minutes, but fix it. 12, good, thanks. Um, <laughs> OK, so I want to thank the organizers, too many to name, especially Liz Hinton, who was my former student at NYU, who you know is just blown up and, and amazing. So just thank you so much. Just brilliant, brilliant. Um, first things first. Um, uh, Brandon, I, I'll pay you back for that, you know, because <laughs> this, this right here is one of the most brilliant scholars of the 21st century for sure. First things first, I hope you will join me in standing in solidarity with the Harvard Graduate Student Union, UAW. Um, <laughs> which has unsuccessfully tried to negotiate with the administration for a fair contract, and most urgent, urgently, a provision that would allow cases of sexual harassment and racial discrimination to be subject to an independent union grievance procedure. Um, they're fighting, you know, also fighting for year-round mental health, health care, uh, paid parental leave, a fair wage, and as most of you know, last Friday, the union's 4,000 student workers, 90% of whom voted overwhelmingly to authorize a strike. And if I'm here, I'm gonna be on the picket line. Um, and I hope, I, but I do hope they don't have to go on strike and the administration will stop spending money on high-powered union-busting law firms and just negotiate in good faith, okay? So, every time I'm at Harvard, I'm talking about the union struggles, every time. Um, uh, Cornell could attest to that, you know. Um, and I know Cornell, say the brother Cornell, right. <laughs> Who's always, always at the forefront. It's so great to see you. Um, speaking of campus struggles, um, as a UCLA faculty and alum, I must acknowledge that this month marks the 50th anniversary of Angela's first lectures at UCLA on, in her course, Recurring Philosophical Themes in Black Literature, that attracted some 2,000 students at Royce Hall um, I think you're the only professor to ever do that in the history of UCLA. Um, that same year, the UC Board of Regents and Governor Reagan voted to fire her. And as everyone knows, and as Erica, I think we'll probably talk about, that same year in January, uh, uh, Al Prentice, Bunchy Carter, and John Huggins were fairly shot on campus. And they were attending a Black Student Union meeting to discuss the future of Black Studies, which was also born in 1969. Um, the same year, incidentally, which is the last time Harvard campus had a student employee strike, it was 1969. So, it's, so this is the 50th anniversary of a lot of things. Um, I first met Angela on UCLA's campus when she spoke at the black graduation. I believe it's 1985 or 86, but the papers will tell, right? Um, <laughs> and Aaron Boy, who was one of my closest friends on campus, had organized it and introduced me to Angela. Um, and as an undergraduate, he and my sister were leaders in the Black Student Alliance uh, at UCLA. And he had recently been accepted into the PhD program in history uh, at UCLA. He was a history undergrad, brilliant. And tragically, he died of a brain aneurysm a couple of years later. I believe he was about 29 years old. Um, and incidentally, um, around that same time, I got to know Trevor Fowler, who was the Southern California Secretary of the ANC, who also spoke at a conference we organized on imperialism. So it's like a kind of homecoming in many ways. Now, I know that um, Angela is probably a little uncomfortable with the focus on her, <laughs> when her mantra has always been on the collective, not the individual. 
Um, you can't find anything she has written that doesn't say that. Um, this position doesn't derive, however, from false humility, but from her analysis of the dialectic of structural oppression and collective movements, which is why she has always grounded herself in uncertain social movements, unlike most professors. I thought last night's panel, yeah, it's true. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just, look, I'm just telling the truth. Um, now, I thought last night's panel with, with Fania Davis, with Margaret Burnham and Bettina Aptecker uh, um, and, and Skip made this point brilliantly, underscoring her groundings as an internationalist. Uh, the year I met Angela, I was working on my dissertation on the Communist Party in Alabama, which became this little book, um, which included the Southern Negro Youth Congress and its leaders, Dorothy and Louis Burnham, Esther and James Jackson, Augusta and Ed Strong, and of course, Angela's mother, Sally Davis. I mean, the first thing I said to Angela, I said, like, I, I'm studying your mother and involvement in the Southern Negro Youth Congress. And in doing that work on the Communist Party in Alabama, I came to understand how a place like Birmingham could nurture revolutionary internationalists. It made perfect sense. You know, it made perfect sense. But what I want to talk to you specifically with my time is to talk about her Palestine work, in part because her profound thinking about Palestine is a global struggle that intersects with feminist, <laughs> abolitionist, anti-racist, anti-colonial, and anti-militarist movements has significantly shaped a new generation of activists who have shattered the cone of silence surrounding Israel's occupation and apartheid policies. Um, for example, <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, earlier this year, um, the, when the board, of Re the board of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute withdrew its decision to give her the Fred Shuttlesworth Human Rights Award, mainly for her Palestine uh, solidarity work, it was mass pressure that forced the board to come to their senses and to reverse their decision. Ironically, the, the controversy further elevated the question of Palestine. The Birmingham Committee for Truth and Reconciliation, which had been leading uh, local demonstrations in the streets of Birmingham, organized a homecoming event for Angela on the 16th of February that not only drew 3,000 people plus, but featured a conversation about Palestine, which would have never happened had they not made that mistake, you know? <laughs> but again, Angela sees the moment to, to take advantage of it. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying Angela, the audience, I mean, because I know her and I feel like if I say Professor Davis, it's gonna be a little bit awkward. Um, <laughs> although I will always say Professor Gates. <laughs> He said, don't call me Skip. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> so I thought it was interesting that the, the Institute's official statement never explained why it rescinded the award, only that was a, it was a matter of public record, that her past statements were inconsistent with, quote, the criteria on which the award is based. When it comes to speaking out for Palestine or Palestinian justice, uh, Angela's racked up an impressive public record um, she was part of that historical, historic Feminist of Color delegation to Palestine in 2011, organized by Rabab Abdul Hadi and my friend and colleague Barbara Ransby, uh, that included Gina Dent and Chandra Mohanty and Beverly Guy Sheftal and Pramila Nadison, who I see over there, and a bunch of others. Um, and Beverly, oh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> They're all here. And, that, and, and I have to say, just very quickly, that was the most important delegation. That was a delegation that was a turning point because people left that delegation and wrote and spoke and really transformed our thinking about it. Every delegation after that followed that, that pattern. Um, but she also has a very long history of solidarity with Palestine, which goes directly out of her dedicated and principled internationalism. When she was awarded the Lenin, Prize, Lenin Peace Prize in Moscow in, uh, on May Day, 1976, she said, quote, I accept this award on behalf of those who seek to seek an end to apartheid in South Africa, to Pinochet's fascism in Chile, and to the continued violation of the sacred rights of the Palestinian people. That's 1976. Um, fortunately, the, the Soviets had no issues with her statement. <laughs> what can I say? You know? um, the Institute's vacillation wasn't just a reaction to Zionist pressure, but a consequence of uh, an old yet all too common Cold War liberal interpretation of civil rights history. This model cannot account for Angela Davis as a central figure in the black freedom movement throughout her life because her conception of civil and human rights knows no boundaries. 
She had fought for and written about black liberation and black lives, abolition, democracy, and socialism, indigenous struggles for sovereignty, feminist struggles for freedom and autonomy, an end to the caging of human beings, and of course, the struggles of all oppressed peoples for self-determination, including Palestinians. Absent a broader international framework, Angela Davis is written into history literally only after 1967, when she moves back to the US. But as we learned last night from um, the, the panel, uh, she was always connected to global struggles for freedom in Birmingham, in New York, at Brandeis University, where she encountered incisive critiques of anti-Semitism, Jewish critiques of Zionism, Herbert Marcuse, and Malcolm X. When she's attended the Eighth World Festival for Youth and Students in Helsinki in the summer of 1962, where she met young revolutionaries from Cuba and everywhere else around the globe. In Paris, where she witnessed French racism against North Africans and met Algerians and Vietnamese struggling for liberation. In Germany, where she participated in anti-war demonstrations and anti-imperialist demonstra demonstrations. In London, where she briefly worked with Stokely Carmichael and Michael X supporting black power in the UK. All this before 1967. All this before arriving in California. Um, Angela's borderless activism and scholarship represent the highest expression of transnational solidarity forged in radical politics um, through critical inquiry via international travel and under the pressure of state-sanctioned confinement. For much of the world, her imprisonment was a symbol of resistance and global solidarity. As an incarcerated political prisoner, she became the center of an international movement whose supporters pegged their own freedom to hers concluding that to free Angela and all political prisoners was a blow to the acts of state violence and racism around the world. And this includes Palestinians locked up in Israeli prisons who had reached out to Angela in solidarity. Her insistence on linking Palestine to the long black freedom movement and to abolition became crystal clear to me, and I'm concluding here, in March of 2018, when as part of the uh, teaching Palestine delegation, we visited the Abu Jihad Museum for the prisoners movement in Nablus and saw the exhibit George Jackson in the Son of Palestine, which is curated by the brilliant black studies scholar Greg Thomas and Mohammed Jamus of Al Quds University. The exhibit revisits that critical moment in the early 1970s when black Palestinian solidarity was an expression of revolutionary global insurgency. And what struck me most was seeing the George Jackson exhibit surrounded by hundreds of images of Palestinian prisoners alongside their writings and artwork, I came away from the encounter with a deeper comprehension of Angela's insight. That is, it, it is not the condition of captivity that is the basis of solidarity, but the critique of captivity from a place of confinement. The shared dreams of liberation, the mobilizing and planning to fulfill that dream. So here in the small underfunded museum in Nablus, a city renowned for its fierce resistance to occupation, we encountered the afterlives of that post-1967 moment in imprisoned men and women who left behind a record of looking ahead in order to produce a radically different future. What brought Palestinian and black activists together in that moment was not just a recognition of parallel oppressions and humiliations, violence and carcerality under occupation, but a shared vision of liberation. So in the end, while Angela is certainly correct about the importance of collectivities over individuals, I think she will agree that there are extraordinary activists and extraordinary thinkers that offer leadership, direction, and insight movements need. And Angela Davis is indeed one of those extraordinary thinkers and leaders, one, one whom I am honored to call a comrade, a teacher, a leader, and a friend. Viva Palestina. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who made the conference possible. And thank you most of all to Angela for being born. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes it stays in my heart. 
is this one. At the risk of seeming ridiculous, the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. And who said it? Jay. Jay. <laughs> so I pondered a long time about what do I say about this precious human being, Angela Davis, my friend. I met her when I was 18. What do I say about someone who's always been in my life at every juncture and every joy and sorrow almost? She's been there, maybe not physically, but in my heart. And sometimes she would show up. I'll tell you more. You know, the simplest things are the ones you remember about a person the way they smile, the way they walk, the way they look when they feel joy or sorrow. And over the decades of knowing a person, I always look for an essential quality that stands out, a way of being that touches the lives of people around them. Angela is generous. She is kind. She is resilient and gentle. So I have a few stories to illustrate this because there's only so much time today. But we have all the time beyond this conference to keep what we are learning here alive, right? right. In 1968, John Huggins, Angela Davis, and I were walking down a street in South Central Los Angeles. I was 18, as I said, and John was 22. And we just met Angela. And we loved her. John Huggins, by the way, was my husband. And he was one of the two young men killed on the UCLA campus, January 17, 1969. He was both a student and a member of the Black Panther Party, as I was at the time. So we're walking down a street, and I don't know if you remember this, but you had on a beautiful jacket. And there was a woman living on the street as we walked by. You may not know South Central Los Angeles, but you know Roxbury. You know Southeast DC. You know where we live. And the woman said, hey, I like that jacket. That's a nice jacket. And Angela stopped to thank her, took the jacket off, and gave it to her. Generosity of spirit. There was nothing contrived. There was no thought about it. It was just a giving heart. And some of us can't even look a person in the eye who's houseless, who's living on the street. We're afraid that they will want something. They do want something. Love. That endeared me to Angela. I knew she'd be my friend when I saw that. Second story. On that day in 1969, when my husband John Huggins was killed, my baby daughter, who's all grown up now, was three weeks old. And rather than something else, the police decided to arrest 14 of us and charge us with malicious mischief. and I was sent to Sybil Brand Women's Correctional Facility in Los Angeles. Of course, we knew those charges would be dropped. However, I can't explain to you what 
I was feeling at the time. But you might be able to imagine. And if you do, it's true. But my brother-in-law at the time came and brought my baby daughter back to me, posted bail, and I walked out into the early morning hours of the next day. I was feeling alone. And I looked out in the dark as I'm walking to leave that prison the first time I was incarcerated. And there is Angela standing in the dark with my friend, Fanny. Just standing there, the two of them. No words needed to be said. No hug needed to be given. It was everything. Great feelings of love. And that was a kindness. I thought to myself on the train to New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I was heading, to be with John's family. Remember all this, Ruthie? Yeah. I thought, this is what we must be, kind to each other, in the face of horror assassination, murder, all kinds of abuses, we must maintain kindness. And I looked at my baby and thought, this is what I want for her. Story three. My baby daughter grew to womanhood and went away to Wesleyan University. And we would talk on the phone sometimes. And one day she called to chat and she said, guess what, mommy? Angela spoke here at the university. I said, she did? Did you get to say hello? She said, yeah, I did. And as with all my BSU friends, I think that's who they were. And they were all young radicals. <laughs> and Angela's, Angela was there. And I think that at a distance, Mai and Angela saw each other and waved in acknowledgement. And all the little BSU students were like, you, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know Angela Davis? <laughs> and she said, yeah, I grew up around her. And she really loves animals. And, and <laughs> wait. And they're looking at my like, and, um, and she said, she's really kind. One day I was at her house and she was playing with her two dogs. You know, Angela can sing her dogs to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and the students, I don't know mine, but were they, their minds the tops of their heads blew off. <laughs> because we think icon. We think separate from us. We think pedestal. And when you pedestalize, you can knock a person down. But when a, there is a human being in front of you, it causes you to think Like Bettina's student last night in the panel who said, I recognize what you can do with a life. But always grounded in love, Angela. That story is just so precious because it un unboxes all these ideas of who we are. We're just folks. Mm -hmm. Right, Fania? We just stand up. 
because the alternative is so horrific. The quality, singing the dogs to sleep, gentleness. Four. After all of the charges against Angela were dropped, I was already out of prison that second time. We communicated by letter, and that really helped me. As a matter of fact, this wasn't one of my stories, but because the state of New York released Angela from solitary confinement, our lawyers went to the state of Connecticut and I was released from solitary confinement. So there are just so many par parallels. But we met after she was released at a house in San Jose. And what did we talk about? We talked about all the people we left behind in prison. How there is no victory in penalizing people. There is no good reason to have prisons. And we talked about what we might be able to do. And Angela has done it. I could list so many things, but critical resistance pops right to the top. When I wanted to become vegetarian and all the members of the Black Panther Party thought I had lost my mind. <laughs> Sister, what's wrong with you? Um, for some reason I went to, to wherever you lived and I said, well, what do you think about being a vegetarian? And we she gave me tips and so on. But what I got was not only her really amazing honesty, but her openness to whatever it is another wants to do to take care of themselves. And I do, and that is partly because you encouraged me. Honesty, openness. So that's all a long time ago. Now I'm vegan. <laughs> and both of us meditate. Did you know that? And practice yoga. Did you know that? If we're going to be in it for the long haul, we must take care of ourselves. It is imperative. There is no choice. We cannot not heal. And I want to say in closing that the trauma we both and many of us in this room experienced at the hands of forces like COINTELPRO, it is important that we make it a priority to heal our hearts, to clear our minds so that we can walk in the world with the purpose of our lives we were given at birth. So throughout all these years, we've remained friends. And it's a friendship based in struggle. It's a friendship based in uplifting humanity. There isn't a, a box that needs to be opened to release people from it that Angela hasn't helped in turning over. And I would say that it goes beyond the identity spoken about before. Every area where a human being is incarcerated, within or without, Angela wants the end to that. How do I know it? She never said it like that to me, but I know it. I know it. So thank you, Angela, for everything that you are and will continue to do. I'm sure there's more that will unfold. And I hope that people that come to Harvard and 
use the collections, will see that your life did not stop after a trial. <laughs> after you have continued and will continue to live a life that is a guiding light for many, including me. As promised, that was just an incredible, uh, rich set of contributions. And um, we've got a lot on the table. We've got these questions of internationalism on the table. We also have, I think, um, Erica Huggins' challenge is so poignant. For those of us who try to teach and write the history of black radicalism, how often do we use the words generous, kind, mm -hmm. resilient, gentle? when we talk about that moment, uh, when we talk about its legacy. So um, I wanted to ask, just following up on, um, on Erica Huggins' remarks, how should we think about, you know, you, you all have either participated in such struggles or, or know so closely the, the, the textured lives of individuals. How should we think about uh, what drives people to participate in revolutionary movements, right? Um, many people suffer oppression, but many people do not answer the call to revolution. How do we understand that impulse, and how do we understand what sustains people throughout the course of the, the, the really um, enormous horrors that are visited among people who try to stand up and fight in the way that uh, you fought Erica Huggins and you fought Trevor and, um, and, and, and uh, how, do, how, do, how do we work through that? Anybody can speak. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> some, some things that, that come to mind. One thing that I have found looking at people who've been involved in radical movements who have been surveilled, harassed, incarcerated, um, brutalized, physically beaten, uh, faced atrocious conditions, is that <clears throat> sure they, they're, they're not unafraid, right, as they go through those moments, but they feel a sense of collective support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important because for many people, we remain unorganized. We're not part of organizations, in other words. We're outraged, but we're not part of any organization that may be collectively moving forward um, in a way. We don't have that sense of comradeship, that there's someone else to rely on, that if we step back, someone will step up. If we're weak, someone will be strong. Um, instead of feeling like we're the only one and you know it's, it's on us to do it. So it seemed to me that um, some of the motivating factor or is this sense of collectivity, um, this commitment to cause, um, this sense that the alternative is worse, mm. that inaction is worse. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there needs to be more of that today. We tolerate a lot. When you think about people who are marching, millions of people marching um, and organizing to, to, to make change. So those are the things I would point to, just the courage, the simple courage, um, moving through fear and not being immobilized by it, the sense that there's somewhere to lay your burden, um, not just yourself. Um, those things are important. Certainly big ideas matter, you know, political commitments matter, but I think these are the things that allow people to keep going in the face of the resistance that's gonna come to your resistance. Um, can I just add to that? Um, Collectivity is extremely important, and I think this is a point that Angela's always been making, and I totally agree. Um, I always want to underscore that point. And struggle's not an event, but a process. Mm -hmm. um, and by not being an event, by being a process, um, you know, having 
you know, written about the Communist Party, for example, where people were committed to that movement for a very long time, even when at the lowest point. Part of it has to do, I think, with being part of a process of being able to envision winning something as opposed to being in a position of self-defense. Uh, when Erica talked about, the, uh, invoked Che Guevara and this idea of great feelings of love, great feelings of love and comradeship with other comrades, other people in your movement, uh, you're caring for them and you're caring about the future of people you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that sense of caring is a positive element. And I, sometimes we think of, of radical social movements as kind of self-defense, like you're defending against or you're, resist, or you're so oppressed you have no choice to move. But I think that great feelings of love, um, being part of a collective, um, and recognizing the struggle is a process rather than an event are, are like three really important dimensions. But, yeah. um, I, I would say that one of the key driving factors is when you're, when you're young and you're revolutionary, it's the idealism. Idealism of the society that you'd want to see. And I recall an incident in... Um, 1992, my, my son, who joined me, who was born in the US and joined me in South Africa, and it was during the height of violence, in, certainly in the province that I was in, we were losing 60 people a week. Mm. And um, uh, he then said to me some years later, you know, Dad, whenever you'd leave, I wasn't sure you were coming back. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, oh, son, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I would be coming back. It's, it's just the TV. And it was only years later did I come to understand that what he said was true. Right. Actually, when I went to an area that was extremely violent, the possibility was I wouldn't come back because bullets were flying by our heads. And, but you don't think about that, you think about what the, the future looks like. And for, uh, for us, under apartheid, the past was so horrific mm -hmm. that uh, the future uh, really looked very bright. And I think that's what drives m many people, is that vision of this future. Can I just follow that up with a question? So, you know, one of the most uh, fascinating moments of recent history is the attempt after the end of apartheid uh, to pursue truth and reconciliation. And there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of support for it, there's a lot of criticisms of it. And when uh, Erica Huggins was talking about COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program of the FBI, and the ways in which our government uh, systematically violated the rights, murdered uh, American citizens. I mean, there's no controversy about that. That's what happened. We've never had a reckoning with that e immense abuse of state power. Uh, and so I was wondering if, if you two in particular could speak to, is that something that this society needs to call for? A kind of truth and reconciliation about the the, the repression of black radicalism in the radical movements of the 60s and 70s? Well, first, the, the, we would need to call for um, a conversation about American chattel slavery. We, we can't talk about it. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, Brandon, but there are high school textbooks being written that say that Africans came as migrant workers. Workers, right, right. A presentation of a high school friend of mine said his teacher said that Africans came as settlers. So we need a conversation about the impact today of slavery. We, we can't go back and live there. I'm not concerned about living in that era as much as I am to look to analyze what it has to do with the conditions now. Mm -hmm. Our, many of our, and we, I don't know another way to say it, growing up in 
Washington, D.C., I had this feeling I had to get out of there because the White House is like the big house and the rest of it was the plantation. And that was my young mind trying to analyze something. But what I'm saying is that the poverty is the intentional result of all of that. So then here we come, these young black people at that time, and there are young black people now. I mean, when I talked to Patrice Cullors, she wrote a book. Yeah, when they call you. When they call us a ter when they call you a terrorist, why is this continuing? Right. It's systemic. It's not a mistake. It's intended. And so we would need to look at the history, <coughs> not to wallow in it. Yeah, I, you know, there's one other parallel between um, South Africa and the US. And that is that uh, South Africa is one of the most violent mm -hmm. societies in the world. Mm -hmm. The US is probably the second. Yes. And I think it has its roots in slavery. And in South Africa, it has its roots in the apartheid violence. So we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which addressed really those individuals who were victims. But in fact, in South Africa, it wasn't just the people who were imprisoned. It was the society as a whole. That's right. So in the period that I was talking about in 92, children in Soweto walked to school or took a train and would pass a black person laying on the street with a newspaper over their head, who was killed by violence by the police. And we, we really didn't do a societal inspection or introspection on what that meant. And so the, the, the violence that exists in our society today is because people grew up with violence. They saw it daily. Yes. And so it becomes common cause. And we have one of the highest murder rates in the world because it is common cause. And, it's, and this question about how you uh, repress people is not just through violence, but also through other means such as drugs, etc. Um, as in, in our big cities, drugs is a huge problem. Um, in, in Cape Town, 12 people get killed a weekend through violence in a city population of about 2 million, right. 2 and a half million. 12 people a weekend. That's every weekend. 70 people a month. It's just horrific. But it's something that we have to really address, this kind of violence, which has its roots in the violence of the society that preceded it. So let me, um, before I open up to questions, let me just ask one last thing, following up on this point, to, to, to the Robins. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, so this, you know, the, the, the population that Trevor is talking about, right, the, the, the areas where there's the most extreme violence and where there have been enduring forms of concentrated addiction, um, homelessness, these are in many ways the populations that the black radical movement in the 1960s and 70s tried to organize, right, under the idea of the lumpen proletariat. And that was one of the great innovations in their form of Marxist theory was to say, well, actually these people are the vanguard. These people can contribute mightily to revolutionary struggle. And I'm just curious as to what do you think is left of that idea? What can we learn from that effort today, um, particularly in a world where students just have no access to the idea that that was once the guiding light of a whole generation of activists and intellectuals? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. 
I want to first start by saying that um, in response to the previous conversation that there is an effort by black grassroots feminists. Uh, there's an organization called Black Women's Blueprint, and they have created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission around rapes and state violence. In South Africa today, rapes and state violence all over the news, especially related to some of the incidents around the death of some um, and the rape of, of college students on campuses as part of that. So I wanted to say that that effort and that model has been held up in, in some parts of the US, um, led by black feminists. I think that there's a lot of talk. People are very interested in the working class, black working classes, I would say, um, in a way that marginalizes those very people from those conversations. Right? People are always trying to talk for this group of people or claim they came from at one point in their past, <laughs> this, this amorphous mass. Um, but it's, it's very important to understand that black power was rooted in those areas, black intelligence, mm -hmm. yeah. black organizing, um, all of that came out of those conditions. And when we think about leadership, that's where we should be looking. Instead, I think people assume that there's kind of a mass of unorganized or, or sort of clay there that is waiting for people who um, you know, have degrees to go down and to, to speak to them. But the reality is that when we think about how to flip where we see the political vision and leadership coming from, that is when the movement will change. That is when the organizing will change. Um, there's a sense of not looking in the mirror, I would say. It's not, never us, it's not the us, right? It's, you know, if it's us, it's us to speak for them. Why don't we go and become students? and learn and listen and contribute and do what we're told is versus trying to um, put leadership on. So that's how I always think about um, those areas. There's so many organizations and groups that come out of, of those um, areas that nobody really talks about. Right. right, exactly. In fact, this is the problem. The problem is that there's a, we should make a distinction between the, the theory of the lumpen mm -hmm. and what actually happened. Because mm -hmm. what happened was the majority of people who live in urban areas, even in that period, were working class. They were not necessarily, they weren't hustlers. They might have been hustling to survive because they were underpaid, but many of them were actually wage laborers. Mm -hmm. They were actually part of organizations, church organizations, labor unions. It was a very organized community. Mm -hmm. um, to be a student in the 19, late 1960s, 70s is to be connected to those communities. Mm -hmm. UCLA shifted to a quarter system to basically try to make it difficult for working class black students to organize. You know? That's, right. That's why we went from semester to quarter system. And it works. Um, not entirely. I'm just kidding. Um, but, but, the but the fact is, is that we, we have to rethink that history. Um, one of the organizations I've written about, we're trying to get the, the book uh, reprinted out through Verso, is um, the group of black feminists who are rooted mainly like in New Rochelle, New York, places like that, who put together the book Lessons from the Damned in 1973. Mm -hmm. These were black feminists, many of whom were working in social work, um, who were grounded in a community, who basically put together a book of writings about revolution and the possibility of transformation from, from people from ages 12 to 80. And this was a working class grassroots initiative. That's what the revolution revolutionary movements look like. They don't look like the way we see on TV. Um, and so I think that I just want to just support everything Robin said, which is we need, to re we need to do the work and rethink that history. And I think that Angela's papers will actually help us do that. You know, That's fantastic. Um, so let's, uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. Uh, there's a microphone right here in the middle. Please remember that questions end in a question mark. <laughs> we want to keep them very tight so that we can hear from lots and lots of people. You will rob students of their one chance to ask these people a question if you go on and on. And I'd love to have my dear brother, Cornell West, ask the first oh, question. Oh, I'll tell you what, though, it's just, just such a blessing to have such a towering figure. My dear sister Angela here, and thanking Elizabeth and the others. My question is this, how is it 
that Angela Davis is unique and singular mm -hmm. in being a towering and great public intellectual who came from the academy but was never for a moment in her life the darling of the liberal establishment. That's right. That when you think of Du Bois, of James Baldwin, of Mary Baraka, you think of Ishma Reed, they all had moments in their lives where they were pushed forward by an, a liberal or neoliberal establishment and then they went radical because they were still free. Now Malcolm X was never affirmed by the liberal establishment, but he's not a product of the academy. See, but, but Angela Davis was able to have an organic relation with those Sly Stone called everyday people, go through the academy as a freedom fighter and a magnificent scholar and intellectual and never have that stamp. And it seems to me that that is distinctive and I wanna know why that is the case. Was it her charisma? Was it how she dealt with her, her celebrity status, always rendering it a form of service rather than a moment of spectacle? Was it the love? Could have been the love she got in Sunday school. I don't know. She might have had that before she got to the Communist Party and Brent Brandeis. Could have been her mama. Part of it is a question of Sister Angela herself. You know what I mean? But this question for me is a crucial one if we're really going to understand the role of progressive intellectuals in the academy that requires some liberal filtering to give them a stamp before they then go off and be free. And most of them, you know, have challenges in that regard, and it's understandable. And that's not just the white liberal establishment. It is also Angela's courage to be critical of the worst tendencies of the black bourgeoisie. That's right. That's courage. And yet here she stands, dignified, brilliant, still bearing witness, and still got that love and kindness. All right. Do you all want to respond or take the next? We'll take, we'll take the, the, let's take the next. Hi, my name is Kyra March. I'm a sophomore at Harvard. And one question that I had for all of you is that at this institution, a lot of, well, as a member of this institution, we're being trained to be elites. And a lot of the time, a lot of Harvard students feel as if they have to go back and be saviors for the working class black community. So my question for you all is, how should, how should I use my privilege as a Harvard student? How should we all use our privilege as prospective intellectuals to be able to contribute to the, to the black freedom struggle? And how should we do that adequately? Okay. All right. South Carolina, right? Yes, there sir. There we go. Straight out of South Carolina. <laughs> what are you studying? African American studies and women and gender Woo! studies. <laughs> I'm sure you have some things to say about that. Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, I think that's a deep question. That's so important. One of the things I'll say is that um, the book that Dr. Other Robin was talking about, about uh, lessons from the damned, those working class people in New Rochelle and Mount Vernon were mentored by a member of the black elite. Um, who worked with them, who worked alongside of them, and then left them alone to do the collective work that they had to do. When you find yourself in institutions like these, and I'll say as someone who went to Columbia University, who came from a background that didn't necessarily pave that path, um, you have to imagine that, one, that you belong here, mm -hmm. right. and two, that whatever you can get, you can use you know, you can use, that you're here gaining the tools that are needed and through the service to your community, not help, but service, because of the knowledge that you'll gain around the balance of power and the reality of institutional inequities, you will come to see um, the work that you do in those communities as, as service, right? And I mean, that's what I would say. And also join an organization or two. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, join an organization or two that's rooted in your community that is not necessarily super political. And then join an organization that mirrors your politics. And then push in both spaces, you know, push hard for increased radicalization. 
I mean, that, that is what I would say. I'm proud that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Desiree Lara, and I am a sophomore in high school, and I'm part of the, I was part of the Summer of Hope Kids this summer. Nice. And my question is, how do we mandate schools to teach the history we as students of color need to know in order for us not to continue to perpetuate the violence and trauma we see? Mm -hmm. And mostly like in state school, in like in community schools like in Mattapan and Dorchester, how do we as students get to know and like understand how we're living in a world of such violence? And yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, there's so many responses. How to mandate schools to teach that history. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a struggle, that's a long-term struggle going back even before there was such a thing as uh, what Carter G. Woodson called Negro History Week, mm -hmm. you know, which became a month, which became what it is. Um, so <laughs> I have to say my own personal opinion is that um, it, we have to keep fighting to change the curriculum, but I, I guess I'm not as optimistic about our capacity to change the curriculum without changing the institution. So to try to, so part of it's about changing schools, transforming schools, if you can't do that, I think it's imperative on all of us to, fig, to create institutions that outside of the traditional public school system can actually provide that curriculum for students. I mean, you know, we talk about history, I mean, there's so many initiatives, like I, I was just writing about the Kim University based in Chicago. Uh, Leith Mullings, for example, is someone involved in that, where you did, basically had students who created a school for the community. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Black Panther Party had schools. Erica Huggins, <laughs> one of the great educators, has always been committed to community-based education. You know, in other words, create curricula and cr create institutions that could actually do that work, because it's very hard work. And that's not to say don't stop fighting to, to create these mandates. You could do both those things at the same time. Um, and can I, no one answered Cornell's question. So can I, can I just, because this is a very important question. This actually may be linked to, to the two questions before. Um, I know other people who are much smarter than me have more to say about this, but I think one guess, and I think Angela should probably answer this, uh, one guess in terms of, you know, two, two guesses, two answers. One just has to do with what I was saying before and what was said last night, that um, Angela threw herself in social movements in a way where she has never been disconnected, ever. That's so unusual. I mean, you're, you're one of the exceptions, Cornell, which never been disconnected, always committed, committed to actual struggle. Even if the, even if the ship looked like it's, it's sinking, it's like holding on to that, not for the purposes of glorification, not for the purposes of getting something on the CV, but because these things matter. That's different. Um, but at the same time, I think part of it has to do with gender. Um, there are not many women who actually could have that, mm -hmm. um, can make that claim to sort of have a moment in the sun and then sort of like, you know, uh, back away. Everyone you mentioned, of course, were, were uh, male intellectuals. And I think that that has a lot to do with it because when we start making the list of all the committed revolutionary black women who have been doing this work for a long time, we've never had that place. Right. Uh, Angela's one of many. Mm -hmm. um, I think we begin to see, see this happen. And I think that's a, that's a, uh, a, a badge of, of something we should be proud of. But it also means, and last thing I'll just say about this, which has to do with, um, I guess, the other two questions. Um, I, I can't speak for Angela, she can speak for herself, but I think that, you know, when you do this work, you pay a price, mm -hmm. you know? And um, it's a very difficult price. When the sister had asked the question about what can I do? When you make that decision to, to leap into struggle, you have to be prepared to pay a price. Right. Um, and I'm amazed by how many people pay that price, mm -hmm. especially black women, pay that price. It's a huge price and they keep doing it. Um, and, and we have to create better institutional supports, collect new collectivities to make sure that the price is not great, to reduce the cost 
to support each other, you know, to support you in the work that you're doing. Um, and I think we, we are in, at the academy in a position to do that, and we don't do a very good job at it. We do a good job of, of creating you know, the more formal institutions and getting new books in our curriculum and doing this research, but not providing the kind of social and psychic and emotional space. Uh, and this is what students, student struggles in 2015 today have been demanding that, that kind of psychic and social space that we need to survive, to be able to come back over and over again, not, not in isolation, but in collective. So, but I'm, I just have, just let one last thing. We're in a room full of people, full of, I can't even begin to, I, I see Ruthie, I see Barbara, I see everyone, Farah, all these people who've been doing this work forever, mm -hmm. and they provide like a kind of model. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, luckily, nothing will happen to us today, because if we do, we lose basically like 90% <laughs> of the greatest intellectuals. Ever. <laughs> um, so, I'm just saying that we're surrounded by women who, who, who have who have modeled this? So, and of course, everyone on this panel. So, perhaps I could uh, just add one thing. Uh, Frederick Douglass said that power, once challenged, is no longer power. And I think Angela lives by that motto: mm -hmm. to challenge power, because if you challenge it, it is no longer power. And I think that if you live by that motto, you can we can gain victory mm -hmm. of, uh, for freedom and justice for all people. I, I did want to pick up uh, one last point that I thought was in um, Professor Spencer's comments about the cost of struggle. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she said that I, I wanted to highlight was just that the cost of compliance can be worse mm -hmm. sometimes. And I think we don't do a great job of telling our students honestly about the cost of compliance, about the cost of acquiescence. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've been extraordinarily lucky to be mentored by people much older, uh, and they tell you the stories about people who went along until they found themselves all alone on an island and wished they had a community of struggle to protect them, right. wished that they had stood up and done something that they really found value and committed to. So, you know, when I, when I look at the legacy of somebody like Professor Davis, that's really inspiring to me because she seems to be someone who learned that from her parents and always knew it intuitively that that's the right side to stand on, that those costs would be worse. And I also just want to say echoing, um, you know, Erica Huggins' brilliant career <laughs> is that we have become so obsessed with credentials now that we sometimes think you can't know anything unless somebody gives you a stamp for it. And you should be wary of the idea that people are going to give you the history of black radicalism through institutions which it criticizes, mm -hmm. right? right. right. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it would be antithetical to the analysis contained within. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, when you read the autobiography and you see that Angela Davis is in solitary and she's thinking about Claudia Jones, mm -hmm. the legendary black communist intellectual, feminist intellectual, they're not going to give you Claudia Jones. Right. Not at my school where I remember getting in trouble for saying that the Civil War was about slavery. I got in trouble. <laughs> in the fifth grade, I'll never forget it. And it was about sectionalism. I was like, well, what's, what does that mean? <laughs> slavery. <laughs> I learned something. So, you know, you got to have that initiative, too, and take take inspiration. Erica Huggins was 18. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is all 18. Martin Luther King at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, 25. Mm -hmm. You know, these are very, very young people who are taking a risk and an initiative and they're, and they're preserving these traditions. And you have much more resources now. We have this archive, but that work still needs to be done. We can't hand it off. With that said, we will wrap up the panel and please give everybody a round of applause. We just have a uh, short 15-minute break. Don't go anywhere. The next panel is just as phenomenal. It's on feminisms. Please don't go anywhere. Thanks. <laughs>